Across the last three years, Century has been on a mission to fundamentally transform the model of care for our clients, our staff, and the industry. We will share with you our journey towards ascent-based care, the lessons we've learned, and the people we've learned them with. We're your hosts, Timothy Yeager and Hillary Laney. Welcome to the HRE Podcast. I always enjoy our time to talk together. I know, me too. Yeah. It's always a, it feels like a privilege to get the one-on-one time to chat with you about things that aren't like, this is what we're doing right now, this is what we're doing right now, but it's like the bigger picture conversations. For sure. So I thought we'd just talk about what that is and like, and what we've gone through. Yeah. Um, and what that big picture is. And um, we set down a journey and it was initially with the mandate, PFA and SBT for everybody. Yep. And um, with no resources. With very, like, no resources, <laughs> right? Just and, me. I was supposed to do that by myself. <laughs> yeah. And, but really with this idea that like, can we as an organization be an organization that like leads this industry down a direction that like right. that we want to go and knowing that there are so many like systemic barriers that get in the way of like quality care scaling, could we leverage whatever resources we have at the time and a growing set of resources to like be that beacon and be that example of like what could be. That and it was a proving ground to the organization that it was worth, worth investing it. in. Yeah. And so we, we, we went to Beaverton initially. Mm-hmm. I, I've never really taught, asked this question for you, but, uh, or to you. Um, you never come across as like a, a like nervous or I'm nervous all the time. Or scared. <laughs> but like, that was like the starting point. That was yeah. the moment. And uh, do you look, like, how do you look back and reflect on like, like that, that time we spent together at Beaverton? It was like my first month here. Mm. Oh, no, we went in January. So I had been at the company for two months. I didn't know you very well. I didn't know how the structure of the company worked. And you don't really realize something big is happening. Sometimes you do, right? I feel like there was a moment yesterday that I felt like this is this is the room where it happened. Mm. But that You don't always know that it's the room where it happened yeah. until you look back and you realize it's the room where it happened. And I remember thinking like this is my chance to prove to Timothy that he made a good hire mm. <laughs> like cuz you'd never seen me work. Yeah. You took a chance with me. We were I was spending company money like which is something I never had a chance to do before to go fly to a, a new place with people I didn't know to prove myself essentially. And so I felt a really heavy weight to be successful and to like do good. Mm. Do good work and show that the PFA and SBT is good. Yeah. Um cuz like your exposure to it previously had it been minimal. Yeah. Right? And, I mean, honestly, I reflect all the time, like, if you had more exposure, you probably wouldn't have hired me, to mm. be honest, you know? <laughs> um, not because I'm not good, but because I'm not, like, in the academia. I'm not yeah. I'm not what the literature says is the right person to be a trainer, but I have all the practical experiences. I remember being in that room, running those PFAs with Lisa and Lauren, and you watching and thinking, I might get fired. Mm. Like, this is gonna, this is, like, this is my chance to show that I'm a good clinician. And I felt like I did. And I think it was uh, combined with my first interview with you, as well as some of those early difficult moments we walked through in that time, I think set a place of trust that our relationship could move forward from to do what we've done since then. Mm -hmm. Like, you trusted me to do this. You supported me. And, like, in the past, I oftentimes had leaders criticize me and, like, tear me down for not doing good enough. And you only, like bolstered me like mm. that was amazing and and even I don't think anyone can really grasp the work that you do on a daily basis if they don't watch you do it but even now like two years later you still ask about those clients you still want to follow up on those clients you remember the things about them in that day and so my reflection is like I, it was an opportunity for me to get to know you as my leader mm-hmm. and to understand the organization and to prove myself so that we could get the yes for other things and we got the yes. And we got the yes. As a result of yeah. that, that trip and, and the work that we did. Um, what's interesting is like the narratives that we tell ourselves, right? Like, because um, like your your story that you're, 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 uh, how you felt is much different than like what I was experiencing, experiencing <laughs> yeah. and feeling, right? The moment that I remember is the moment on Lauren uh, Washington and Lisa Watson's face. When they, they had the light bulb? When they ran the PFA and they saw it. Yeah. And they saw, I, I believe, like, 
a, their client doing things that they didn't think they that happened never happen. and never have done before. Yeah. And um, that's what I uh, uh, find most rewarding about this process is that at some point, um, I don't think ABA lost its way. I think the development of BCBA has lost their way. Agreed. And we like have lost done a, the joy of learning. Lost the joy of learning. I think lost the joy of seeing the impact that our science yeah. can have immediately. Immediately. Not and in I two think weeks, that but like right now. there's a large group of BCBAs who think that ABA works because over a course of time they see progress. We can't control the variables that like drove that progress. They don't mm -hmm. see the immediate change. But I remember back to my grad school days when I like I was working at the Fred Keller School and I saw magic happen. Well, that light bulb you're talking about with Lauren and Lisa is a light bulb we want to see with our clients. All the time. Every time you go to teach them. Yeah. Right. And if we're not getting that light bulb, we need to change something. Yeah. I think that that pressure I felt has never dissipated. If only, if anything, it's only like gotten heavier. Right. So we got yeses. You have been such a great champion. And I also have done a really good job of, of sharing the why and the data to support what we're doing. But that can, question is always there. Like, mm -hmm. we're talking about millions of dollars. I mean, this is no longer like a $500 plane ticket to Portland. Right. Right. Like, it's, I mean, we've restructured the whole company. We have more non-billable people than we've ever had. We have more clinical supports in the markets. Our technology development is fully driven by this process now. And that is all resources. And so I feel even more of a heavy sense of responsibility to continue to prove. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the wrong thing. I think it's the right thing to continue to prove that, like, not only is this the the right way to be conducting our business, it is the most effective and parsimonious way to do it. Like, it, it is it works. And as you'll listen through this these podcasts, interviews that we've done, we started on this journey really focused on the clients, but what we've learned and what those these episodes are going to teach us, which we've learned as we did these interviews, is that it wasn't about the clients, right? Yeah. It was about the – and I said in one of the episodes two years ago, I started talking about this. Like when you are doing this work, it is encompassing of a whole culture. It's your technicians. It's your clinicians. It's your directors. It's your operators. It's everyone. The culture shifts and your retainment changes, right? Nobody believed me. Everyone thought I was crazy. Like I'm just woo-woo up here on the <laughs> stage. It's true. I mean, we have now had multiple interviews where that is exactly what they express, that yeah. technicians are happier. Therefore, families are happier. Clients are making more progress. BCBAs are happier. Tech, uh, turnover is lower in some cases, not always. But yeah. that culture shift happened for a lot of places at the organization. Um, and I think that adds to the value add and, and continues my feeling of responsibility. And so right before we started recording, I was saying to you, like, that sense of responsibility is always with me. And we've gone through this big organizational shift where it was me and my team supporting the field in this way. And we've done the right thing to integrate those resources into the regions as the directors of the people, not outsiders coming in. Mm -hmm. But as a result, we've kind of um, diluted a little bit of our support. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing, but it kind of takes us a couple steps back in rebuilding up some of our capacity. And it... It, it is an EO for me. It's an MO for me to just continue yeah. this work. And it's also scary, mm -hmm. you know, because it's all coming back to why I took this job. It is about people who are vulnerable getting services. And when I think about, I'm going to get really emotional, but when I think about clients who are engaging in severe problem behavior and experiencing services that are worsening that, or is a worsening set of conditions, and not necessarily being powerless, but not necessarily having all of the resources needed to support that unit of the mm -hmm. tech family clinician and client. Um, it keeps me up at night. Like that's why I came here is for those people to have a better life and to not have to experience those symptoms of the environments that they're forced to endure. I started on this journey having little experience with the with PFA and SBT to start, but with the sole purpose of I know that we were serving thousands of clients in a distributed fashion within an industry that the one thing that we should be doing well, we're not doing yeah. well. And if we're going to improve how we treat interfering behavior, um, like we have to be able to assess it. Yeah. And and the, the way in which, you know, the majority of our industry assesses, like it's ineffective. is ineffective. And the only effective way up until this was a way that couldn't scale. Right. Right. It was 
you know, it wasn't safe. It wasn't dignified. And didn't always lead to outcomes. It always lead to outcomes. It wasn't always, um, and it, it was resource and time intensive. Mm-hmm. And and then I looked at our data, and, I, and once I got the job, I'm like, we were having a worsening effect we at the are. time, and we needed to figure out how to improve that. The question I have for you, um, you talk about, uh, like, we had this org shift. Your department's changed. Our, um, I think your the response we feel is right on, and you have a bigger, to a degree, I think you have a bigger opportunity in yeah. this new structure. To me, it sounds like you've just gone to the next cab. Oh, it's a cab six job. Right? Like, it's just like, because yes. like, I, 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 I've started to think a lot of things about this in the, <laughs> in the lens of SBT, right? And it's like, we, you mastered that. Yeah. You're it's moving true. on, right? It's a cab six moving challenge. on, it's a harder challenge, right? Uh, some of the things that like weren't popping up before, like may start to pop up, right? And But they were there before. Like, we just didn't see them. They just didn't see them because yeah. of the context, right? And and to give yourself grace as you go yeah. through this. Well, and I think, you know, going back to that initial trip, wanting to prove myself to you. I mean, you are the position of power, right? Like you are my leader and my boss. And um, for me, I I I have done that and continue to want to do that. Like it is no, it's hard for me to say these things because I've never really been in a position where I've had a leader who's empowered me in the way that you have. But it is not an accident that you've empowered me in the way that you have because I have shown up and proven that I'm able to handle these challenges and deliver on what I say. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I'm ready for the challenge because I know, I know that I can do it. I know, but not me. It's not me. It's not me. It's everyone I will be supporting, right? I know that we can do it and I know that I can be the leader of that change. It's more the how and the stress of getting there and the journey. And it's, I mean, you know, like we both know it's exhausting. It's tiring, but it's worth it. For sure. And so it's hard to like balance the worth and the the rest to when the the finish line is ever moving, and we're getting closer and then farther away and then closer. Um, but I know we're on the right track, and I know we have the right people to do it too. I think that's the really cool thing um, from a leadership perspective, but also like our staff on the ground who are actually treating our clients and supporting those staff. We have the right people. Yeah. And that's what we need. So let's like uh, take a step back and. We're talking about this season. Yeah. Um, uh, we, in similar fashion to this journey of starting with PFA and SBT and then having to shift, and we added a universal protocol called the foundational plan. I think this season has really been a shift in the sense that we thought we we're going to talk about everything in HRE. Yeah. And a large part of the conversations that we had were about the foundational plan. Yes, and the culture shift it brought. Yeah, and so I thought um, to set up the 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 rest of the season, we should talk about the foundational yeah, plan. Yeah, let's do it. What is the foundational plan, and how did it come about? Um, it came about because you really thought that we could do SPT for everyone and would solve all of our problems. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's the journey we started on because that was the mandate I was given. And what we found was that doing SPT didn't solve problems because somebody might do SPT for 30 minutes a day, that clients and services for six hours. So that other five and a half hours was a set of worsening conditions that weren't aligned to those values. And so how can we ask a client to trust someone for 30 minutes of the day when they're in the SPT context, when they can't trust them for the other six and a half hours of their day? Like that's to me worse than coercion. Like that's like, that's the, that's almost fawning. Like it felt really gross. And so with a number of clients, we found that, When we started to implement some skill-based treatment sessions, they were collaborating and cooperating with all demands because the environment was right. Right. We didn't need to do SBT with them. And so then we started coaching those clinicians like, don't do SBT. Just put this environmental condition in place for their whole session. Then you don't need to go to a more intensive intervention. And so from there, I started having conversations with you about this. And I had to sell you on it. Like, it was a hard sell because... It wasn't even necessarily your mandate, right? Like it was the company's mandate. Yeah. It was what the you had sold SBT so well that everyone, our CEO, our investment company, they wanted SBT. Yeah. And so we had to kind of change the narrative, and that's really hard to do. Um, and so, and we did. And so we decided that we were going to test. With the it. person at the time was somewhat of an unknown risk. Yes. Right. Like it yeah. was like, and that was a that. I think about what you said earlier. Where it's like how people come together as a function of going through, and I, and uh, um, 
why I always trusted you. Those moments were times of like, how do we trust each other? It and, was and risky. Go through it. Yeah. it was risky. I mean, the contingencies in play on your behavior and my behavior were different, right? Yeah. And it's always going to be that way because, and I mean, not always, but there's always that component of not that you don't want the best for our clients and our staff because you do, but there's a layer for you that you have to do what's best for the organization as the seat chief. How do we do that in a sustainable way? We have to do both of the things at the same time. And I challenged you on that a lot. And so thankfully you gave me the opportunity to show you. Um, We didn't make the shift right away. We had to, we had to test it out and prove that it was the right thing to do. And so we developed the foundational plan, which is, Uh, play on Greg Hanley's universal protocol. But why I think it's different, I think this is a really a discussion that needs to be had, is that the universal protocol from Greg Hanley's team is incredible for people who are engaging in severe problem behavior or who are really struggling with problem behavior throughout their day. Mm. And it's a way to like set almost not a zero expectation environment, but really limit everything as much as possible, provide choice, um, make it a universally positive experience for them. And that is necessary. We have lots of clients who need that. We also have, you know, it's. I think we have data on this now. It's about two thirds of our clients don't need that kind of context. They need, um, they still need a positive environment, but they also can handle many of the expectations and demands. They just need it done in a more environmentally friendly way. And so the foundational plan is a way to do both of those things. Mm-hmm. It's You can beef it up to be really antecedent, environmentally based, to really support people who need a space with all of their triggers managed with the certain kind of staff. They only engage in this way, or you can set it up for a client who can handle their whole environment, but maybe their technician just needs to know how to run their circle time activity or um, what their reinforcement schedule is. And so all of that is in the plan. You can beef it up. It's, it's, it's broken into a multitude of sections that go into like what makes the client HRE, how do you support them during challenging contexts? What do you do when it's time with that for them to work on, you know, technician led st- tasks, What should it look like when it's their time? Mm -hmm. And every client of ours, whether they have severe problem behavior or not, deserves that. They deserve the people who are working with them to know them well. That's where trust comes from. And therapy should be built upon trust. And we say that we're doing a therapeutic service. I don't know why we don't talk about this more often, but a therapeutic service is based in therapeutic alliance. And clients who have severe problem behavior or not need therapeutic alliance with the people who are treating them in order to walk that journey. And so it really is an opportunity for our technicians and our clinicians to know their client, know how to build therapeutic alliance with them so they can achieve their outcomes. Whether they need no environmental manipulation because they they just need, you know, to learn how to know their colors better or whatever, you know, they have minimal skill needs or they have a lot of skill needs, right? So it's, it's a bit malleable document in that way and it's really powerful and helpful. And what we found that's really cool is if you're a technician who's never worked with a client, you can pick up the foundational plan, you can read it and you know you don't have to spend half the day getting to know a client you're subbing on that you're not going to see tomorrow. You're still going to have to take that time, but you have a great place to start. I'm, I'm, I've heard many times, and I'm sure people listening might think, like, well, how how is that different from, like, a BIP? Yeah, I mean, I think we do BIP. Well, we have a foundational plan for every client, regardless right. if they have interfering behavior. So that's one big distinction. BIPs, I think, I don't know. I find the word BIP or behavior intervention plan is kind of a dirty word. Like it's like, oh, they need intervention because they're having problem behavior. Yeah. And so what, we don't use that language anymore at Century. We've eradicated it from our vocabulary. I, I think it's different because in a BIP, you might have sections about like how to set up the environment antecedent to prevent problem behavior or interfering behavior. But it's really focused on like if this behavior happens, here's how you should respond. Yeah. Here's the consequences. Here's the answer for this behavior. Or for this context. Yeah. Um, and it's broken into like hitting, scratching, aggression. And maybe those all have different ways of responding. Mm-hmm. Generally, BIP should be based on a function, right? Like in our literature and the way we're all taught in grad school, well, at least me, I can't speak for every program, but most of the BCBAs that I meet yeah. are taught that you write a behavior plan. And when you write that, you identify the topography of the behavior, the function of the behavior, and then you write a, a plan to the function. Yeah. Right. What technician knows the function of hitting, right. really, right? Like they're they're they might follow the plan for the function you identified as access for the access plan, but it's actually attention, and so they might be inadvertently reinforcing and strengthening that behavior, right? So that's a traditional BIP. For the foundational plan, we take a much more holistic view. We, <laughs> vocabulary can sometimes be difficult, but a more holistic view of like, yes, we need to look at interfering behaviors, and let yes, we need to know how to respond to them. 
But what we need to do more is look at the context they're occurring in and making sure that all of the environmental variables and all of the components that are adding to, strengthening or worsening or um, evoking those behaviors are adequately addressed. It doesn't mean we don't do them. It just means that we are aware of them and we plan for them. I think the other big distinction that we make at Centria gl pretty globally, not completely, is that we do not look at behavior by function, right? We we know function exists and we can acknowledge that it exists and we want to understand the drivers of a behavior. But we fully ascribe to Greg Hanley's research that behavior has multiple functions. There are synthesized components to a behavior and behaviors live in response classes. And so we teach people to respond to the, be the response class under a synthesized set of contingencies. Meaning when a client is crying, it probably serves the same function as the hitting that follows and the elopement that follows that, right? And the SIB that follows that. And so those, those behaviors are all connected and they all related to that initial evoking event that caused the crying. And the crying could have been caused by removal of a stimulus. It could have been caused by a change in attention. It could have been caused by um, re like limited um, escape or it yeah. could be caused by something automatic that we don't control, yeah. right? But we don't necessarily need to parse all of those things out if we're using a synthesized set of contingencies. We don't have to parse it out necessarily. Now, I do want to make a distinction that there are behaviors you have to do that for. I don't think that is a global, every behavior has, like, you can take a synthesized approach for. <clears throat> I was just having this conversation with a grad student yesterday. She asked me, do you ever not do a PFA? Do you ever do an isolated FA for a behavior? And I said, yes and no. And I reference Greg's literature, the lore of the FA. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite articles. That like an, an FA doesn't have to be this crazy big ev like event. It can right. literally just be setting up as like you have a hypothesis and you test it in an experiment. You set up a controlled baseline and then you see if your hypothesis is correct. And so I said, I use a synthesis. If I want to parse out something, say, for example, I don't understand why a client is engaging in SIB. And it appears to me there might be an attention component in it, but I'm not fully sure what that attention component is. I'm going to do a multiple FA on types of attention. Mm. So they're going to have access to that synthesized reinforcement contingency. I'm going to try to get a zero baseline of interfering behavior. And then I'm going to start to change very minimal components of attention to see if I can evoke and turn on and off interfering behavior. Because then I can really use that very specific component of the EO to teach them skills. Mm. So I could do that for an automatic function. I could, so I, I, yes, I do. I will isolate if needed, but I would say 85% of the clients that I see, and I, I will also say I only see, at Centre, I only see clients that are very complex. So 85% of the clients that I see here need that. Most of them we can work with those synthesized contingencies and, and figure things out. So back to the foundational plan, yeah. we, we do take that approach and we, we, we do have people and allow them to isolate things out in the foundational plan if needed. But we more guide them to think about things in that holistic view because behavior does not happen in a vacuum. There are 7,000 stimuli occurring at one time. And we can't say that this one stimuli of access is the only contributing factor right. to a behavior occurring. That's just not the human experience. And to isolate it to that is just, to me... This is my maybe one of my hot takes. I just think it's very bar barbarian. Like, mm -hmm. our science is so beautiful. And it has such an opportunity for nuance. And to, to make it so simple yeah. when the human experience is not, it just seems like a waste of something that's really powerful. Agreed. One thing that I find in, like powerful about the foundational plan, when I think about BIP, being trained on BIP, BIPs that I've reviewed in the past, um, the anesthesia interventions... We're kind of like an afterthought. It's so basic. And it is, it's also like copy and paste. Use non-contingent yeah, reinforcement. Right. And and I also think that like anesthesia interventions as a whole like get a bad rap. They in do. In the sense that like, you know, they're just frowned upon. It's not a consequence it's intervention. It's an afterthought. It's an afterthought. And like and the BIP heavily is based on consequence interventions. And I think it's the, the moment I talked to you about earlier, which is uh, anesthesia interventions are effective when like the antecedents that you've created are the freaking problem. Right, right? that's exactly, like, yeah, you know, you're talking about that. Like, if I'm creating an environment for my clients to like, to, to, to work in, to play in, and that environment is part of the problem, I need to take a step back and think about what are the things I need to change yeah, how so many that times, that doesn't happen. How many times have you had a family and it's like, well, they don't do that with us. Or it's right. like, oh, well, we don't, we hold them more accountable than their parents. And so of course they don't have problem behavior with their right. parents. It's like, well, 
Yes, and that's part of the problem. problem. Like that's not the fu- yeah. that is not the environment they're functioning in on a regular basis. So why would we put them in a different yeah. environment? I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. Agreed. Um, so, in order to make this happen, right? We, we go back to Beaverton. Um, it was you, right? It was, it was you. You're the only person that mm-hmm. we had. And I'm like, you got to roll this out across the entire company. I remember saying, I'm going to need people. And you're like, too bad, so sad. We figure can't it out. hire people. <laughs> like, I hired you. Out. Yeah, that's exactly what you said. And I was like, okay, I don't really don't know how to do this. Yeah. And, and we had directors, right? Yeah. Who told you and told us that they would not do this because they don't have time. And they were right. I mean, I think it was hard for us to believe that they were right, but they were right. They didn't yeah. have time. Yeah, so we had a group of regional clinical directors who we thought would be the the mechanism with which we rolled out training, support, development. And we had these these this role with that clinical in the title. But it wasn't. It was operational. But it was a mainly an operational role. And the, the, despite even, like, them wanting to be a clinical leader, they couldn't be a clinical yeah. leader. And so, in essence, how I reflect back, we were putting them in a position to, like, choose. Like, right. and who are you going to who, – who are you going to, like – you know, who's driving your behavior? The people that hold the contingencies, which is their the boss. Money. Their yeah, boss. The money. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, like, they, they couldn't. And so we had to figure out a, a, a way to do this, right? So um, We had a lot of difficult conversations through this. When I think about, it's wild it's been two years because I think about some of the really hard conversations you and I had about this where I said, you know, I can't do this without other people. And you were like, it's too bad. And I said... I don't know what you want me to do because I can't I can't train 350 BCBAs myself. Yeah. Who's going to train them? And it wasn't you, right? Like for it, sure. there's contingent again coming back to the contingencies yeah. you're under. It is a big leap for a company to invest in non-billable um positions on some hopes and dreams. I mean yeah. the, we had data but it was still some hopes and dreams. Within an organizational culture and context that like had tried clinical initiatives in the f- and they'd all in failed. the past and they all failed and never really delivered on the clinical outcome or like the operational outcome. Yeah. Um it's a miracle to be honest that we're here. So what was the moment we hired first director because we eventually eventually we, this eventually changed mm-hmm. and we started hiring directors. At one point you came to me and said I think I I think I might have gotten it. I think I might have gotten a yes. Who would you hire as your first mm. person? And yeah. I told you, like, here's who I would want on my team. He's like, if you could only pick a couple people, who would they be? And I was yeah. like, here it is. Here's the people I want with me. Here's why. When can we do this? And I think it was pretty, pretty quickly after that that we opened and interviewed Lisa and Kaylin for the roles. Yeah. And then they had just started. I mean, we literally were in Michigan for our first big launch when we hired Ed and Cindy. Mm. I don't, I don't know how that happened, yeah. but I think whenever you had, you were, you were a great champion for us. And so I'd love to hear more about that from you, which is, it was, and anytime you got a, even a sliver of a foot in the door, you blasted it right open. So how did you do that? Like to go from even getting me hired was hard, yeah. right? To go from that to, I ended up with seven people on my team. Yeah. How did you make that happen? So it first started with organizational alignment. Like ensuring that everyone was bought into the, the vision, um, and, and we what we were trying to accomplish. Early case studies that we were we had early share. case studies, the the result, the success that we had in Beaverton, mm-hmm. um, both from a staff like satisfaction as well as like client outcomes, as well as a parent of the client yep. just reaching out to us without even like, like prompting, prompting or soliciting. They just they came to, and reached out to us. So that that was the promise, right? That that like was like the motivating condition. Um, and then it was those difficult conversations that we had with like market leaders. They're like, I can't let you have like my arts, my clinical director's time. Like yeah. they don't have the bandwidth. And I said, well, you know, we could hire some. And then once they like, I even threw that as a suggestion, it was eaten up. the market leaders were like, if, if you can just hire two people to do this and not take, like, from, and us. take from my time, then I would support that. Um, and then it was two people. Four. Four people. Six. Six, and then a seventh person. Yeah. And uh, I am forever grateful, like, to, to those seven individuals because, like, every single one of them has set, uh, has lived up to the promise of what good leadership could be and the impact that we can have. 
and really are part of the journey towards the organizational shift that we've had as an organization. I mean, when we hired Lisa and Kaylin, we had some really difficult conversations. We talk about this all the time, the three of us, where we said to them, you might not have a job in six months. Yeah. Like, this is an experiment, and, like, you have to prove your worth. Yeah. And they did. So fast forward a little bit more time. We have six directors. We're rolling this out. Mentorship's going well. We mm-hmm. um, mentored about 120 people. People. And uh, we get a new CEO. Mm-hmm. And he says, do it tomorrow. Yeah. He's like, I want you to get it done. I think it was in six months. Six months or less. So he said four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I asked for six. <laughs> and so, like, we were put into a position to where we had to accelerate and yep. figure out how. Because at that time, Nothing had changed in the organization. Nothing had changed in the organization. But we also weren't, I think, aware that, like, the rate at which we were mentoring clinicians, we would never get caught up. Oh, we were aware. You told me every day. Yeah, like, (laughs) we we were never 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 going to finish. Because if it takes six months, right? Yeah. And you only have six people doing it. Yep. We hire 120 people a year. So we would always be behind. Agreed. So then we came up with the other idea. Yeah. So I, you asked me to step away and come. I had to. I, it was a lot of work. Like it yeah. was not easy to think about how we do this in six months. And we also included the foundational plan, PFA, SBT, and then you were like culture. I was like, okay, great culture. Well, the only way we can impact culture is if we're in the actual places where culture is happening. Like, I could remote in every day and it won't change the culture because I can't see what's happening behind the scenes. And so I came up with this plan to utilize some of our champions from our first couple rounds to be half by the time BCBA so that they weren't non-billable. They were meeting their like minimum requirement to be not a negative on the company. Um, And in those markets, train their peers with our support. And thankfully, David said yes, because I didn't have another plan. I didn't know what else we would do. Um, And so we embarked on that journey. And again, like just kind of like everything we've done, it was on hopes and dreams. I remember us like, we were developing the CLR clinical leadership role. Resident, yeah. Clinical leadership president role. And it, we there were so many questions of like what happens after. Because we told them six months, you're in this role. What happens after? And we had to say, you're going back to be a supervising clinician. We're not going to keep this role it's open. It's short term. Yep. Not a promotion. Like it's an opportunity for you to show us that you want to be promoted. So you might be considered. But there is no promise here. And I don't know. A lot of people said yes. Like we had, I think, 18 people who... I think we had 36 apply and 18 who, who signed on for that unknown. And um, it was rough. Like, it wasn't easy because everything that we've done, even today, is an experiment. It's a hypothesis, yeah. right? And we can only learn from my hypothesis. We're doing that right now as we're learning, which we're going to talk about in a second. But we had originally set this out as, like, they would do 20 billable hours and they would do 20 hours of training others. And very quickly, I was coming to you and going, this is, like, this cannot continue. Like, they're working 50, 60 hours a week. They're so committed to us, and they want to, like, they're going to get in trouble if they don't build one. Not trouble, that's the wrong word, but they're being held accountable, right? So yeah. from their perception, they didn't want to be in trouble. They wanted to show up. They wanted to be leaders for us. And I think it was a combination of so much trust that you and I had built that you trusted me in that. And you pushed back hard, really hard on that and. Um, I shared that with them. You know, I, I came to the team on a regular basis and I said, you know, hey, this is where we're at. Here's what we need to do to show the value in reducing your billables and what I need from you all. And so I got a lot of data and I came back to you with the data and said, you know, this is where we're at and this is what we need. And you did what you do really well, which is you wouldn't got a yes. And we were able to decrease that 20 billable to 12. And um, that was in like two and a half months of starting this yeah. rollout. The last thing you ever want to do is, and this is like what smashed me across the face once I saw the data. The last thing you want to do is like run your best employees into the ground. Yeah. Even though they're going to run themselves into the ground because they're so aligned to the values and the vision of the company. They would have done it. They will do whatever and it then takes. They quit. But that's not us being good stewards no, it's of not. our employees. Yeah. I mean, that's the opposite of what we're trying to do, right? Yeah. And I think it's hard to go in front of people who aren't connected, like our our stakeholders yeah. and and fall on your sword in that way and say like we we miscalculated mm-hmm. um and so you needed the data to be able to do that and i think having that data and that passion to say like these are our future leaders that we're going to lose if we don't change is what needed to happen for that to, to to shift and so we did i mean for the last it's been eight months now but for the last eight months we've been on this journey and 
we lost one CLR, but other than that, they've all just been incredible. And the majority of them have become DCSs for us in this new structure. So I do say um, the journey you and I have been on, and I don't want to take credit away from anyone else on our team, but the work that you and I have done through the Foundations of Care is what set us up for you to be able to go and make the case for the change of the organization. Like we could say all day that our data needed to change and our clinical data needed to change. But without a model of proof, I mean, it's that trust, right? Yeah. The model of proof that you can make a change, that you can make an impact, nobody would have given you a yes. And a clear evidence of that you have the leaders to do it. Right. Right? Like, we, you can make the case, and we made the case long before that, like, we had to go down this route. But if you don't have the people to do it, Leadership is all that leadership matters. Leadership matters so it matters much. Matters so much. And that's one thing I'm most proud about in this clinical leadership residency program that we had was that we have developed some incredible leaders. Really incredible leaders. And even the CLRs who, um, excuse me, didn't become DCSs yet, yet, right? Yeah. They're still incredible leaders. For sure. And they will be leaders for us. If they, and I, I just, I know some of them might be listening, and I just want to say to them, I know it's hard to not have gotten a promotion out of this, but they have every making to get that role. 100%. And they just need to, to continue to grow with us and lean in, and that will be their role, right? Yeah. Like, it's there for them. And in some cases, it's because there wasn't a role available, and others because there's just a couple more skills we need you to learn. But they showed us they can learn those things. For sure. So we went through the CLR. Now it's your turn. So we went through the CLR journey, and about halfway through, you started to make a pitch to change the organization because clinical is not was not at the forefront, and we realized it needed to be. So, what did you do from that point? Um, we have a values and vision line company at the time. Our executive team, like, wanted to do good work, um, and I knew that, and I felt that, and I felt that as a chief clinical officer, I was part of a team who truly cared about the clients that we were serving. Um, and any mis like uh, any challenges that we're experiencing, any shortcomings, failures that existed, were not necessarily a, a failure of intent. It was just a failure of execution. Yeah. Um, and knowing that we were aligned in that way, I, I took the data to them and said that like, here are the things that we need to improve upon. What data did you take? I looked at like how well how many clients are progressing on the goals that we have for them. What was that? Not good, right? <laughs> it was how so many? Bad. Um, how like. Uh, um, like what our treatment planning looked like, what our programming looked like, the need that our BCAs have to like be mentored and to be developed and be supported. And because how the impact was on the clients. Yeah. And how um, our organizational structure was kind of like suffocating that. Mm -hmm. And and so we made a pitch to go towards this dyad model to where every clinical leader had a clinical leader. Right and had an operations leader. No, no, every clinical leader had another clinical leader above them right. who had another clinical leader above them, and that they were being supported. We think back to us having to hire directors because our RCDs didn't have the time and capacities because the 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 people that were holding the contingencies were operators. Were all operators, and they had a different set of goals. They did, which is important, necessary, right? And but you can't hold both at times, and uh, and so now we move to this. This dyad model, to like you said, every clinical leader has an operational partner, but every clinical leader also has a clinical mentor leader. and a clinical leader. Um, and uh, that's a hard decision for an organization to make when we are in our most like stable. As, as an organization, we are in the best place that we've ever been at that point as, as a business. Um, and I'm really proud as an organization that we made the commitment to like change things. It's a positive. It's an a upward trend. Yeah. With the phase change line. For sure. Right? And hoping that that trend continues continues. Up. Yeah. yeah. And so we we're months into that journey. Yeah. Um, and, um, but there's no way that, no, like, there's, I can't imagine ever, like, getting that approved and or us being successful without our mentorship program, developing the leaders and demonstrating that, like, clinicians can be leaders. Yeah. I mean, there's a mistrust in the there was and continues to be, right, like some skepticism on both sides of the fence, right? Yeah. From an operational standpoint, there's um, skepticism that clinical leaders or people can think operationally. Yeah. And on the other side of the fence, there's a mistrust that le like clinical or that operations people can consider things yeah. clinically. So how is the how has the split been going? Yeah, it's uh what's interesting is that we've built into the system conflict. 
right? So when you have a peer who has a set of contingencies that may be different from yours, and you have a group, like, set of interdependent contingencies that you need to work together on, like conflict can come about, collaboration comes about. And so that's a feature, not a bug of the system, right? And that's, that's something that people um, have to like embrace and understand. So like we're, we're working through that in training. I think it's going, in, in some ways it's going really well. In the, in the areas that we're challenged and struggling, like it's those are like growing pains that yeah. we're, that we're working through. Well, it's like we we talked about this in one of our one of the episodes you'll get to listen to, is going through challenge with somebody is a great way to build rapport for sure. And so, when you go through something really hard, or like when you go through something personally really hard, you don't call the person you go out drinking with. I mean, that might be the same person, but it's not the person you call for a good time. It's the person. If, I think of the episode of Sex in the City, if anyone's ever watched that, where Miranda <laughs> hurts her back and she's on the bathroom floor, covered in, not even covered in anything, and she calls Carrie Bradshaw and Carrie sends her boyfriend. And so Carrie's boyfriend walks in on Miranda naked on the floor, unable to move, and he has to help her. Miranda called Carrie because Carrie is her person who can see her through those really uncomfortable moments. Yeah. Right? Um, and that can the dyads can be that for each other. For sure. It just means that both people have to lean in and be willing to go through the challenge in a way that is dignified. It comes back to our values. Like it comes back to a place of dignity, respect and compassion and empathy for one another and perspective taking. Agreed. And those are skills. So um, we're going to uh, um, introduce the audience to a number of really awesome leaders in this organization. And so across this season, uh, we got the chance to you know, meet and talk with uh, people that went through our mentorship program, technicians, mm-hmm. um, directors, directors. Who now went through that dyad shift. Yep, yeah, and now area, in an area director yep. as well. Um, what can the audience expect as we as we talk uh, as they get to listen to these interviews? I think that somebody who's tuning in to the Happy Relax and Engage podcast probably knows something about Happy Relax and Engage. <laughs> And there is always struggle, right? Like in the in the community of this, there's this phrase of making shift happen. And shift is really hard. Mm. It is not without strife. It's not without tears. Um, but it's also not without triumph. And so I think in these episodes, anyone who's tuning in can, I hope they can hear what those trials and tribulations look like and how to navigate them for themselves, right? right? Because many of the people who are going to be, you're going to hear from, are going through it. Now, they had a lot of support, right? And I think that's a a really important distinction for people is our organization has a lot. We have a lot of support for those people who are willing to go through this with us. Um, But it wasn't always that way. And so I think they can expect to hear stories of how this um, practice has shifted other people's clinical practice, their leadership skills, impacted their clients impacted their own personal lives, right? Yeah, and I, I I'll just say candidly that they're, they're going to get to hear like some of the people that I'm most proud of. Yeah. And um, it doesn't matter what the movie is. If there's a moment in a movie where there's like triumph, where there's like someone overcoming the odds, like those are tear-jerking moments for oh. me. And I, and I know there's a number of stories that we got to uncover of people like growing, challenging themselves and like overcoming in ways that like – like we didn't necessarily think it was going to happen as a result Agreed. of this. And one of them, like I think this is a, a very well-known experience for someone who's trying to make the shift to compassionate care is that there are haters out there. There are yeah. people out there who don't want to do this with you who are going to undercut it and do anything they can to make it stop. And we are going to talk about that. Like, that's sure. a difficult component of this work, and it's a necessary component of this work. Agreed. I'm really excited about the podcast and the in- interviews that we did. I hope my hope is that people can walk away. I always hope whenever I have a chance to like speak or share my story, I just hope people take away tools and skills that, that will help them do this work too. I think anyone should come work here if they can. Yeah. I think it's a great place to work, but I also want everyone in the field to be doing work aligned to this and any tool or support I can give to people to do that is a reinforcer for me. Um, to end this episode, what's your HRE? <laughs> um, it has, sh- it shifts. I think this is something we don't talk about enough, which is like, depending on the context, For sure. your SR, your HRE will change. But one that will always put me in a good mood is <laughs> if I like, I love my kids. We've talked about this a lot, but I love my kids. 
either they have to be engaged in something and not needing me or like yeah. playing alone, watching TV. So like I have some space. Like so that is always a component for me. But so like some space for my kids where I have some uh, time or maybe they're with me but like close by doing their own thing. Um I am usually at home maybe getting ready for something or there's nothing going on and I am moving around. But right now my HRE is very new. Mm. And is that I'm listening to Taylor Swift and dancing and singing. And I am I have become a Swifty in the last year. <laughs> And Taylor Swift is a part of everything that makes me happy right now. I love her lyrics. I love her music. She just re-released a new album. And so I'm listening to like her new five tracks on repeat, oftentimes maybe on TikTok or <laughs> something like that. But like everyone's kind of doing, taking care of themselves. And I have a moment just to be like, carefree. no one's watching me and carefree and silly with Taylor Swift, which is a really silly, fun, no problem yeah. hobby. What about you? What's your HRE? Um, there's a few different ones, but like the one that like, like just feeds my soul is, uh, time with people. So there's a people component, like an attention and conversation component. Um, I'm consuming something. So it's either like dinner, whiskey, uh, coffee, whiskey, coffee, a cigar, not all at the same time, right? Like, like consuming something in like a quiet space. Yeah. Um, and having like meaningful conversation with people. Um, connection, something that's like really important to everyone. I just, uh, I find that in our worlds where we're, we're so busy and doing so much that like just sitting down in some like quiet and slowness yeah. and like having like real connection with people. Um, so that like, brings me a lot of joy. That's probably my second HRE, but as I always say when we talk about this, you have to add in that someone else has to pay for dinner. Yeah, because her <laughs> steaks are expensive. <laughs> I do love steak. And if I can ever go out to dinner and have a good steak on someone else's dollar, I'll also pay for my own steak. I don't have yeah. any problem with that. Yeah. But it's just a little bit better. If someone else is paying for if it. If someone else is paying for it. And also I'm not driving so I can have a couple glasses of wine or some something to drink. Yeah, It's a good one. But I think the one of the reasons I think you and I get along so well is that, that uh, the, con the connection and the like time to really – get into meaningful discussion is a high, highly preferred reinforcer for both of us. Yeah. And what I think is so cool is that it's led to just some really like, I could never have imagined this, what we've done. Yeah. Never could have imagined it. It's like things that my wildest dreams are made of. And it's why I said yes when you offered me the job. I had a lot of reservations, um, but your commitment and your willingness to be open and your like drive and your vision um, I didn't know if it was ever going to come true, and I feel like we're getting there. Like we're not even, we're not even not on the. We're pretty far along the journey. Yeah, I, you you hit the nail on the head. I'll send it here in that like everything's been a, a hypothesis and test, hypothesis and yes. test, and um, while not everything went to the plan that we thought it would go down, like everything's gone in the right direction, and most of the things that have like worked out in the way mm -hmm. that we could have never imagined them to work right. out well, like. The getting to hire your directors, mm -hmm. like I was happy with two, and then yeah. we hired seven, yeah. right? Um, CLRs, like I initially posed that we like hire eight people, and then it was eventually it was like sixteen yeah. people, right? And that we thought that those would be promised that like they may have a job. That now they're all directors, and that the majority of our directors hired Jerry and Batul with a promise that they'd either travel around Michigan oh, and train PF, like, PFA yeah, and SBT on a hope initially. And a dream. Yeah. Now Jerry's traveling around Michigan doing that and Batul's traveling, traveling around Arizona, Arizona and doing that. And like, um, it's just a very proud moment. And, and this season's gonna be about talking about a lot of those moments yeah. with the people that like have really been influential in this process. They are, this is my final note, which is it's a test and a hypothesis. And with any time you do that, you get data. And we have, we have, including the people you're going to hear from, learned from and grown from that data. And I think that's why we've continued and been able to continue to grow. Yeah. yeah really excited. Yeah. Awesome. And that concludes another episode of the HRE podcast. Thanks for listening. If the HRE podcast is a part of your synthesized reinforcers, let us know what else would make the perfect reinforcement context for you in the comments below and join us next time.